I'm just trying to, as a layman, get my understanding like on point here because sometimes when you guys talk, it makes what happens is my physical association with the world kicks in, and I'm like, well, that can't be because it's not that, and so you know that's why I'm asking this. Yeah, and it's it's a good question about how how are you to picture the the existence of you know solid solid this existence in terms of quantum fields you know it's a rather yeah. abstract underlying description so that's absolutely true okay but but you're right what you said that they're just the the, the particles are the we'd say the excitations in the field but gotcha true. all right um very cool can you start with a standard model and derive quantum field theory from it no no, the standard model is a quantum field theory. So, and, and there are there are lots of what we call free parameters. So that the ultimately things are put in by hand, and there are a lot of them. Does that make <laughs> put the in by hand. standard so, model that much less satisfying to you? As it's, it's not complete. It's certainly not complete. I mean, for example, one of the most wonderful examples um, is that. So, how many matter particles are there in the standard model? So there. Are, so to make up you and me. So what's the, the minimal description of us? It's up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. That's it. And the up quarks and down quarks make the protons and neutrons, which sit inside the atomic nucleus, and the electrons go around to make the atoms, and that's it, right? Three ingredients, basically. And there's another one called the electron neutrino, of which there are a lot streaming through our head now from the nuclear reactions in the sun. So the four things, that's it. Now, it turns out that there are also two copies of that set. So there's a thing called the charm quark and the strange quark and the muon and a muon neutrino. So the muon, for example, it's, it's a heavy electron. It's identical in every way except it's heavier. And then there's another set, the top quark and the bottom quark and the tau and the tau neutrino. So three sets of these things. So the, the one that makes up everything and then another two. Why? We don't know. We don't know why there are three so, so It's a good So job the particles are. of the universe are in triplicate, yeah. except we are familiar only with that lowest energy regime yeah. with, the, with electrons and... And, yeah, and then we discovered the other ones. And, and we, yeah. we, we, uh, we, with some very straight little caveats, we, we know there are no more than three. Why not? Um, How do you know there are no more than three? Be, because it was, so the caveats are, are very weak, but so at the uh, LEP collider at CERN, um, throughout, throughout the, the 1980s, 1990s, that, that machine was, well, it was built in the 80s. It was run through the 90s. And it, did you have a position at CERN for a while? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I worked on the, as we're building the LHC, I worked on some ideas for little detectors close to the beams and, okay. and so on on the Atlas experiment. Before that, there was an electron-positron collider there called LEP, which was in the same tunnel. And that was really a, a factory to make things called Z bosons, or Z bosons, as I call them. And um they're to do with one of the forces of nature, the weak force. And by measuring exactly the, the what's called the lifetime, the behavior, let's say, of that particle, you can see how many things it can decay into. How many, because basically the general rule in particle physics is if you're very massive and you can fall to bits into lighter things, then you will. And the more chance there is, the more things you can fall to bits into, the, 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 more, the more rapidly you fall to bits, right, basically. So you can measure how many particles this thing can decay into. And so with some caveats about other, other generations, as we call them, being extremely heavy, and you wouldn't see them, then you can, you can see how many different kinds of particle this thing can fall into. So it's a very famous measurement. So, so we, we're sure that there are three, these three copies. Three and only three. And, but that looks like the, the periodic table of the elements, right? Mendeleev going back all those, all those years ago. So the, the, the pattern that you can see when you learn, that we all learn at school in the chemical elements, and there's an underlying reason for that, which is quantum mechanics and the way that everything works. But So there will be a reason why there are only those three families, uh, uh, but we it's don't know what it is. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> okay. It could be that. That's the reason. <laughs> so yeah. so, so, so there's, there's a lot of that in the standard model. Right. There are a lot of things that we don't know. We don't fully understand the Higgs particle at all. Okay. We've detected this thing. It is... Got the, the Nobel Prize given. Yeah, and Higgs. it's a remarkable um, new property of nature, a new kind of thing in nature. Um, but exactly how that works, whether 
and why? So, so we know that it gives masses to the fundamental particles, at least in the standard model, that's its job. But, but why it gives the masses to them? You know, so th those are, wh why is the electron the mass that it is? In the standard model, you say, because it interacts in this way with the Higgs field. And you go, why does it do that? And we say, we don't know why it does that. So, so there, are, there are a lot of things in the standard model that you have to measure. And so it's not a theory of everything by any sense. And, and how come it doesn't contain predictive. gravity? Well, so now you're asking about a quantum theory of gravity. Yeah. And the Einstein, up, up, up with it. Einstein spent a long, the, the last, what, 20 or 30 years of yeah. life trying to find such a thing. Mm, don't cop out on us now, yeah, no. Brian. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Einstein <laughs> try, tried this for so a while, we don't guys. Know. So, yeah. so, no, we don't so know. So I, I interviewed, I did great, it was an honor, actually. I interviewed Roger Penrose a few weeks ago and, and chatted to him about these things. And Roger Penrose is one of the greats of the 20th and 21st century. He got the Nobel Prize for his work on black holes for really a very famous paper from 1963, Six, I think I it was. 66? Was it 60s? Yeah, 60s, mid-60s, yeah, yeah. Where he showed that with very minimal assumptions, uh, a star, a sufficiently massive star will collapse to form a space-time singularity, a black hole. So, inevitably. Yeah. yeah, inevitably. So with uh, so Oppenheimer and Schneider did it in the in just before the Second World War, but with some assumptions about symmetry. And, and you could say, well, nothing collapses in a perfectly symmetric way, so you wouldn't form a black hole. But Penrose removed those ideas. But he's a great relativist. He's a great, uh, you know, a real expert in general relativity. So he would not, you know, the, the, I suppose the fashionable way to think about this is general relativity comes from quantum mechanics, but we don't know how. Oh. And there's some support for that from the study of black holes. <laughs> Thank you.